Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us on um, the McShin Foundation's award-winning podcast, Get in the Herd. Uh, today, I have with me special guest, Gigi Langer. Uh, she has just come out with a book called 50 Ways to Worry Less. Uh, and I have read most of the book, admittedly not all of it. Um, I tried doing some of the, uh, the exercises that are in it. Um, and to be quite honest with you, I, I thoroughly enjoyed what I read. Um, Gigi, how are you doing today? I'm great. Thank you. I'm so glad to be here. Well, we're glad to have you Nice here. to be meeting you. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, so you are both an author and a woman in long-term recovery. Um, yes, tell sir. Tell us what, uh, what led you to, to write the book. Oh, you know, I, I often say that once I quit drinking, I realized what a thinking problem I have. And uh, remember the old timers used to have, have that poster up that said, don't drink, don't think, and go to meetings. Yep. And uh, so, you know, once, once I realized that and I started doing the inventories because I was in a 12-step program, I really just realized how much my thoughts were torturing me. And uh, I got into, you know, therapy and working the steps and especially step six and seven, I think are so valuable. Once we mm -hmm. realized I termed that negative thinking. I know a lot of people in the program call it the committee, you know, the committee right. that's always so helpful, you know? Yep. And yep. I, what, what, what the committee whispers is what I call in the book whispered lies. They're lies about who we are. You know, you're not right. lovable. I, You'll never I remember stay reading about sober. That. <laughs> Yeah. So I, I started identifying them as lies and I, and I started building my spiritual fitness in the program. And uh, especially with the 11th step and realizing that, you know, as they say, God don't make no junk. So right. I was thinking of myself as this defective person. And what the spiritual uh, lessons were teaching me was that I was you know, in essence, the truth of me was goodness. And I wasn't defined by all those bad things I had done. It was just my brain still telling me nasty stuff. <laughs> right, right. It's, uh, it's amazing how even after we get clean and sober that our brain tells us those things that we're, you know, bad people and that we've done such horrible things that we're not redeemable and all that. Um, and there's that there is that leftover uh, I don't know what to call it um, ideology that that we're never going to be good enough you know um, right yep one of the things that I noticed as I was reading through the book um, I, I felt I felt like I was doing step work at the same time um, there was a lot of similarities to to step work that I saw in the book. Um, you know, with, with all of the time that you've, that you have all the clean time that you have, I imagine you've done the steps plenty of times. Um, talk oh, to yeah. me about, talk to me about the, um, I guess the, what influence did the steps have on writing the book? Cause I, I feel like they had a, a big influence on, on the book itself. Yeah. You know, I, I, uh, realized I wanted to write a book. Oh, I think I was maybe 20 years sober and I had been to visit my mother and I was on an airplane and I was feeling so grateful for how open my heart was to her and how loving mm -hmm. I was able to be as opposed to how I had felt in the past. And I thought it would be so great if somehow we could convey the things that we've learned through the steps and that I've learned through therapy and energy work and a bunch of other healing modalities. How could I share that in a way that the normal person who may never get into the rooms might uh, gain some of the tools and uh, practices that we've learned that are so helpful? pull to us. Sure. So you're right. It's, <laughs> it's very influenced by the 12 steps. Yeah. And yet I think I had one person read it. He kind of knew he had a drinking problem, but he mm -hmm. wasn't owning it. And after reading the book, he said, I'm 
going to go to a 12 step program and he's been sober ever since. So even some of the people not That's in awesome. recovery are helped by it. But I have to say most of the audience for the book tends to be people in recovery. Right. Yeah. Right. Um, what was I going to say? Um, the, uh, the exercises that you have, I've, I've, to be, to be perfectly honest, I've never been, uh, really, I don't know how to say this, the, the, the best at reading, I guess you could say self-help books. Um, I've always thought that, you know, um, if you, if you really need help, you know, go seek therapy. Um, otherwise, you know, you're just kind of wasting your time. But as I was reading through this book, um, you know, I, I really, like I said, I really started doing the exercise and everything. And I was like, oh man, uh, you know, it, it really, a lot of the stuff hit home. Um, and, and I realized this isn't just like every other, you know, self-help type book that that's out there. Um, it really has a lot of valuable information in it, especially for, you know, someone that suffers with substance use disorder. Um, is this the type of thing that, you know, you would say, uh, for someone that, that, that needs help, they start here and, and, you know, move on to, to maybe, uh, you know, a 12 step program or, you know, to like a therapy situation, or is this something that someone can, you know, jump into and, and kind of help themselves out a hundred percent, you know, what, what's, what's the best recommendation there? Sure. Well, first of all, thanks for those kind words. I'm a former teacher and I, I really like it when things are concrete and clear. So, right. and I do love the, ins the inspiring self-help books that I often found that, you know, just tell me what to do, darn it. So right, I right. made the book. So it was, you know, my story, what I was suffering with and how I discovered this particular one of the 50 tools, you know, and mm -hmm. then most of the times a little exercise to guide you through it. So it, it's very concrete. So thank you for that. In Absolutely. terms of where to start, where to start, whether to start with a book like this. I, I suppose there is no wrong way uh, as long as a person's seeking help. I think that the sooner you can get to a face-to-face -face or, or video-to-video um, individual to help guide you, like a therapist or a recovery coach, mm -hmm. I think the sooner a person does that, the better. And here's right. why, obviously, because we think we can fix ourselves. How many self-help books did I buy and try? And, you know, and right. the problem was, as long as we are numbing our feelings through using or romancing or shopping or overworking, mm -hmm. when we're divorcing ourselves from our feelings like that, it, it's it's very hard to grow because we're not really owning what our patterns are. <laughs> we're right, covering right. them up and denying them. Mm -hmm. So I guess the, the recommendation would be to hang with someone that you can be really honest with, who's a very, very helpful person, not someone who's going to just tell you their stories, not someone who's going to jump on your miseries and make you feel even worse about them. Someone right. who has been down the road before who can offer help and who can offer healthy resources. That's my recommendation. Yeah. Gotcha. Um, you know, it's, it's, I, I, you said, uh, you know, someone that you can be honest with. Um, and like me personally, so my sponsor that I have right now and have had the entire time that I've, that I've been in recovery, this is my second go around in recovery. The first time, uh, I got about six months then decided I needed to go out and do more research and, uh, you know, came back. Um, he was my sponsor both times. Um, and okay. this guy is someone that I've known for the better part of 20 years. Um, we've been really good friends. He's been, he's been clean in the rooms, uh, the entire time. Um, so he's got about six years under his belt. Um, I've always had people tell me, you know, or, or warn me against, oh, you know, you don't necessarily want someone that, that you're really good friends with, and you don't necessarily want someone that you've known for a long time. You want someone that's, 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 you know, uh, can kind of be, 
the word indifferent is not correct to use, but uh, someone that, uh, how do I say it? Uh, s someone that is is not going to be your friend and only going to be your sponsor. And my reply to that is, well, the reason I chose someone that was, you know, that I'm such good friends with is, let's face it, I'm an addict and I know how to bullshit people, you know, uh, and he can see through that. He knows when I'm doing that, you know, because he knows my patterns. He knows my habits. He knows how I can be. And when we're going over step work or, or, you know, just talking in general, uh, he can look at me and just say, dude, come on, you know? And to me, me personally, I think that's very valuable um, because it forces me to kind of have that honesty, you know, and, and to have that, uh, you know, well, that, that honesty, um, you know, and, and especially when it comes to doing step work, um, you know, you gotta be, you gotta be a hundred percent honest when you're doing that stuff. Um, sure. And I think that's, I, I think that's a very valuable aspect of, you know, our, our sponsorship. Um, what are your thoughts on, you know, when it comes to sponsorship, do you pick someone that you've been friends with for a while? Do you pick someone that, you know, do you pick someone that you find in a meeting? You know, um, what was your process? Yeah. I think it's different for different people, frankly. Um, one thing I'll say is if you have a sponsor that you don't know, but you think you could be comfortable with, chances are they've sponsored a lot of people before and they know some of the bullshit that's going to come out. <laughs> right. <laughs> so right. sometimes it, you know, they don't have to necessarily be my, have known me personally for a long time, but definitely it needs to be a person who has their own sponsor, who has worked the steps diligently. Mm -hmm. For me, um, I, obviously, someone who has no romantic possibilities for you. Uh, right. And, you know, I had, I had known how to manipulate men and so on. So, you know, of course, I wanted to hang with the men at first, because that was my comfort zone. But right. uh, I didn't know how to manipulate. I didn't know how to manipulate women. So it took me six months of meetings before I ask someone to be my sponsor. And oh, I don't wow. necessarily recommend that, but that is, right. and I didn't drink during that time by the grace of God. And I was going to say, by the grace of God, you uh, came back to the rooms after that one uh, research yeah, tour you took. I, uh, Thank God for that. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, uh, I had to hit my bottom and I hadn't, hadn't hit my bottom the yep. first time. I apologize. I am having all kinds of mic stand issues here. It keeps wanting to fall off the desk. Um, I'm oh, going to do the best I can here to just, yeah, it's, it's a okay. brand new mic stand. Yeah. I just got it. And yeah. Anyways. Um, yeah. Yeah. But I think um, you're right about the sponsor thing that it shouldn't be someone who's going to be too easy on you. I mean, people, right. we know ourselves, you know, Maybe I need someone to kick my butt. In my case, I needed someone to be very gentle and not confront me because I was so lacking in um, confidence of my own perceptions. You know, I, right, I didn't, right. I, I had screwed up my life, screwed up my life royally. So I didn't want to rely on myself. I wanted to rely on someone that I thought was wiser. <laughs> yeah. Right. Um, you know, another thing they say is that, you know, when you when you're choosing a sponsor, you should choose someone that has something that you want. I've heard that said a lot of times and I love my sponsor to death, um, but I got to be honest, I don't want anything he has. Um, you know, he his life is pretty chaotic. Um, you know, he handles it. Uh, he, he does a fantastic job, um, but. I really don't want anything that he has. Um, and that's kind of one of those, one of those aspects of sponsorship that that's, you know, like I, for instance, he, one of his big things is um, he was able, you know, after he got clean, he, he was able to uh, regain custody of his, of his son. Um, well, I don't have any kids, so that doesn't apply to me. Um, but what I can tell you is that, you know, the one thing that he has been able to, to maintain is kind of a, a calmness, regardless of all the chaos, you know, 
And that's something that I find extremely valuable and, and almost in a way, look up to him for that. Um, oh yeah. Um, you had touched on, you know, um, you, you felt more comfortable with men. What do you say to, to someone who maybe wants, you know, you know, a, a, a male who wants a female sponsor or a female that wants a male sponsor? Um, that is, that's one of those things that I've always heard that it's not a good idea to do. Um, but I know plenty of people who do that. Yep. Is that something that can, that, I mean, obviously it can turn into a problem, but what are your, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, you know, I think it's preferable to have someone. I mean, the whole thing is the, in my case, I was addicted to romantic love when I came in, in addition to sure. alcohol and marijuana. And so mm -hmm. for me to, you know, make a man my, it's sort of like a temporary higher power in a way, your mm -hmm. sponsor, you're, you're giving them a lot of authority to suggest things to you. And you're saying you're willing to follow those suggestions questions. Right. So right. it was much better for me to have a, a woman. But, um, mm -hmm. you know, if there's no romantic spark, I know women, younger women who are sponsored by way older men, I know a way, you know, I've seen it work just as you have. But for the early years, I do think it's preferable to have someone that has no romantic uh, attachment. Right. And I right. was going to say in, in response to your, you know, want what that person has, I think you, you hit it on the head when you said you don't want necessarily what he has, but you want who he is. You mm -hmm. won't want how he is in the middle right, of his right. life. You know? mm -hmm. that, yeah. That's what I admired in my sponsor too, that calmness, yeah. no matter what. Um, switching gears a little bit. Um, we, our, our CEO here just wrote a book, um, just got published two twenty two of this year. Um, uh, and it's called, uh, scattered pink. Um, and she kind of talked to us about the writing process and how that was, uh, can you touch a little bit on that? Like how was the writing process for you for, for, uh, 50 ways? Sure. Well, I had been in a, um, academic job. Uh, for 25 years, so teaching at a university, and I and I had done a lot of um, academic writing or technical mm -hmm. writing. It was a uh, um, mostly for teachers. I was in uh, education and psychology, so I wasn't, and I had even co-authored some books. So I had been through the process of the drafts and the royalties and all that. So right, right. the deadlines. Um, and I, that's partly probably why my book is uh, very um, concise and practical mm -hmm. <laughs> because yes, that's what I is. valued when I wrote for teachers. You know, I didn't like the jargon right. and so on. Um, but anyway, so when it when I retired and gosh, it must have been 10 years after that, I thought, geez, um, I think I really want to write a book. Then I, I wasn't so... Well, first of all, we don't do anything big. We don't have any dreams unless I think our higher power has nudged us to move in that direction, to move toward right. it. When we get ourselves clear enough through multiple uh, inventories and multiple six and sevenths and eights and nines and multiple healings with different therapists and different modalities, then we're... Uh, I wouldn't say 100% of the time, however, because if the shit hits a fan, I'm going to lose it like anybody, right? But I'm going to oh, yeah. have my tools and I'm going to have my posse of women around me. So that's that's a great mm -hmm. security for me. But anyway, we get these, um, we're clear enough to get an inspiration. So I had to trust that, you know, that I was running to my computer wanting to write this. So I don't think my mm -hmm. higher power would have nudged me there. So I, I uh, ended up publishing it through my own publishing company. And that was the, it wasn't nice. writing it so much. The writing, I mean, I sent it out, you know, you follow 
all the directions that the nonfiction publishing people give you. So you just buy the yeah. book and follow those steps, you know? Right, right, right. But I'll tell you what was hard. I don't know if you've gotten to chapter six yet. Chapter five, actually, chapter six is where I talk about halfway through the book, my husband, whom I met in AA, started drinking again. Oh, mm. that was fun. So I wrote the whole chapter about how that went. And then chapter five was my cycles of healing. Ultimately, after 10 years of sobriety, realizing that there had been some sexual abuse, which I didn't even know about. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Excuse me. So um, it was the honesty that I put into the book that turned out to be a little challenging because disclosing some of that stuff was not easy. I can imagine. I can imagine. Yeah. Um, I do have. Sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, I was going to say I have a little cough. Are you able to stop the recording and then start it again? Uh, or should we? Well, we're going? actually live right now. If you need to, uh, if you need oh, to okay, clear great. your throat or something. Yeah, um, I can put on a commercial real quick. Um, and you can get yourself some water or something of that nature. Yeah. If you don't mind, that'd be great. Thanks so much. Sure. No problem. We'll be right back. Here at McShen, we believe in the McShen way, which is authentic recovery support service providers, people with lived experience, bringing that experience to those who need that lived experience in recovery. Here at McShin, we believe in many things to support our mission. We believe in women empowerment. What I love most about what we believe here at McShin is we believe in the authenticity of the peer-to-peer -peer approach. Here at the McShin Foundation, we believe in giving people opportunity. Here at McShin, we believe in the inherent worth and dignity of every person. At the McShin Foundation, we believe in helping people reach their full potential. Here at the McShin Foundation, we believe in multiple pathways to recovery. Here at McShin, we believe in placing principles before personalities to help spread hope. Here at McShin, we believe that recovery is possible and that any person seeking recovery can become a more acceptable, responsible, and productive member of society. Here at the McShin Foundation, we believe in self-discovery. Here at McShin, we believe in saving lives and offering second chances. Here at McShin, we believe you can do this. Here at McShen Foundation, we believe that we can only keep what we have by giving away, which is why we continue to help others like us seek and find recovery. gentlemen we are back with author and woman in long-term recovery gg langer uh thank you for uh sticking with us on that commercial break there um what i want to say is uh first off uh the book is fantastic uh it's 50 ways to worry less um you know it's got a lot of inspirational Here's stuff in there like. yeah there you go there it is um it is available as a uh uh, hard copy or uh, ebook, right? Right, right, and an audio book. Oh, and an audio book. And it has a little, yeah. yeah, and it has a workbook that comes with it too for writing out the exercises. 
Excellent. Yeah. Yeah. There's a lot of exercises in there and those exercises are actually really helpful. Um, so we were talking about Thank the, you. uh, the writing process and all that and the publishing process. And you said the publishing process was, was the more difficult part. Um, and you got, right. you said you had your, your own, uh, your own publishing company. Yeah, there, there are a couple of choices. I mean, the first choice is, are you going to try to get an agent and get a contract with a big bona fide publishing company? Mm -hmm. uh, that's a long-term process. Um, then if you self-publish, you can go with one of these presses um, where they're trying to get you to buy their services to publish your book. And they oh, okay. give you a flat okay. fee and then they use their own editors and their own covered cover designers and so on and they mm -hmm. they'll only let you make so many changes it's so i don't recommend that if you have the talents to uh you know i had been a project manager so i kind of knew how to get estimates for different parts so i farmed out each piece and then right. i was sent the exact right person you know one day i was at a meeting and a woman said hey what's new and i said oh we love this gal that we know how's she doing and then she said, what are you up to? I said, well, I'm writing a book. And she said, oh, my God, I know the perfect editor for you. And that's how right. so many of the people came to me. Uh, so, yeah, I did little contracts with each person that did a part of it. The, the Beautiful. publishing Beautiful. parts. Um, yeah. that's, that's outstanding. Um, you know, I want to switch gears a little bit. Um, and I want to talk about recovery for just a second. Um, and the reason I want to do that is because, well, obviously because we are a recovery podcast. Um, but this, you know, to me, the, the, the book itself, uh, it can be a very, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, influential. Yes. Um, but, uh, 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 an important piece of, of the recovery process, um, you know, one of the things that we go through uh, when we're in recovery, especially early recovery, is um, we get clean and then we have to sit with our emotions. And one of those emotions that we have is worry, anxiety, um, you know, stress, things like that. Um, and those are all triggers for, for anyone that suffers with substance use disorder. I mean, shoot, anyone really. Um, that can trigger you to do a lot of things. Um, and, you know, reading through the book, um, you know, it gives you, it gives you these tools, um, to, to kind of manage that, that stress and, 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 you know, manage that, that worry. Um, one of the things that, um, that has really, you know, helped me, uh, is my girlfriend actually gave up everything, um, you know, when we, when we got back together, um, she, she doesn't suffer from substance use disorder. Um, but she, you know, she did drink a little bit, um, and she completely gave all that up, which is awesome. She's been a huge support in my recovery. Um, you know, and, and in the book, it mentions that, you know, your, your, uh, your husband started drinking again. Um, and I haven't, I haven't had to deal with that. I haven't had to, that hasn't been a thing. Um, how, how do you, I guess, how do you deal with that in a, in a real life, you know, setting, I suppose, um, you know, how do you, how do you say no, you know, I, I can't, you know, I can't partake, like, I don't even know the question I'm trying to ask really. Um, yeah. If you um, want to know what it was like, it was really scary. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I guess that's it what I'm getting at. What, what is it like? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, it was really scary. And I, you know, I, I immediately went to Al-Anon and my sponsor works Al-Anon in addition to AA and a lot of the people I, I know, um, in long-term sobriety have, have high quality ability to deal with tough things. They, they work right. uh, the 12 steps also in Al-Anon. So I went running to Al-Anon first thing, okay. got a sponsor, started working the steps because I did not want to 
conf- I think this is true for any problem in our lives. That's why most of my tools are first getting ourselves unglued from the ceiling with our anxiety and then mm-hmm. next accessing our higher power or an energy technique or a spiritual technique to get ourselves mm-hmm. into a calm place where we can receive uh, good intuitive guidance. So I knew that right. I didn't want to approach my husband from my high anxiety, terrified place. Sure. I would just make the situation worse. So exactly. by working Ellen and I got a chance to kind of get my head together, get myself together. I mean, we did have a conversation early on about how, you know, he understood that I was hanging with 12 step people all the time. He'd been in the program for a long time, but hadn't been going to meetings for a long time. And he, he did acknowledge, you know, understand that it was scary for me because of me sponsoring people and seeing people relapse and all the ugliness right. of the disease. Mm-hmm. Um, so, but then um, there were a couple of occasions where I saw him inebriated and that really scared me. So I tell right. that whole story in the book. Um, ultimately, we had to sit down after, it was not a pretty picture, the whole thing. Right. You know, <laughs> when I mm-hmm. finally did talk to him, I ended up making him mad you know? Right. And, uh, and then he didn't talk to me for a little while. And this is the person I had trusted. Uh, Mind you, a symptom of my substance abuse disorder was failed relationships. So (laughs) Peter, my husband is my fourth husband and we had been married 25 years or so when this happened and I had never seen him have a drink. Mm -hmm. So it, it was very scary. I, I went through all the steps. I, it's good now. We, we, he, for some reason, because maybe because his drug of choice was cocaine, mm-hmm. that's what he went to treatment for. I don't know. I didn't know him then, but uh, he has two drinks, no more, no less. Mm-hmm. Occasionally, he has turned into a social drinker, which for me was one. That's it awesome. Was the only yeah, the only tolerable outcomes would have been total recovery or ability to drink socially with no damage. Because right. what terrified me was that he was going to go down the tubes and that would be the end of our finances, our marriage, our love, etc. Right. So mm-hmm. I and I clung to my higher power. I clung to my friends. It, mm-hmm. it took almost a year, maybe eight, nine months. Right. And what I'll tell you, <laughs> the whispered lie was all men hurt women. Your dad hurt your mom. Your dad hurt you. And this man is hurting you too. Do mm-hmm. not trust him. And I put right. my dad's face right on him. And oh. I had to get over that. Yeah. I had to get over that. And all, when I looked at it without all that influence, which took quite a bit of therapy and help. <laughs> I could see, oh, this is still the same man I married. <laughs> He's able to right. have two drinks. Go figure. Right. That's that's fantastic, yeah. though. That's uh, uh, I, uh, me personally, I. It's hard to explain. I, I say all the time that I'm uh, what I call a permissions guy. So what that means to me is basically once I give myself permission to do anything. I've just given myself permission for a total, a full on total relapse. Um, I could probably go out and, you know, have a few drinks, um, and get to a certain level of drunk, um, and then stop and then go home, go to sleep, wake up, feel like shit afterwards, but nothing will happen. But once I give myself permission to do that, I give myself permission to do whatever Mm -hmm. else I want, you know? And it's difficult right now because, um, you know, cannabis has been all but legalized um, in Virginia uh, and several other states. Um, And now there's a bill. I don't know if it's if it's become law that, uh, you know, they're allowing recreational use. Um, I haven't really caught up on all the cannabis news, but I know that it's it's very quickly gaining traction and becoming legal and, you know, this, that, and, and the other. Um, 
that was one of my favorite things to do um is me too you know, yeah yeah um you know it, it, in in my eyes uh there was nothing better at the end of the day than to come home and light one up and relax in front of the tv and eat three bowls of cereal and go to bed with a stomach ache you know that was that was one of my, my most favorite things to do um and it's difficult right now because you know when when i was in active addiction it was completely 100 percent illegal you know no ifs ands or buts about yeah. it. and now all these you know everything is becoming legal and there's dispensaries in in virginia now and and i mean you it's almost like you can buy it in a gas station you know um <laughs> and i still have to think back to you know my my whole permission thing you know if i give myself permission to do that which i could i i could be an end of the day you know smoke a joint type person you know um but if i do that i give myself permission for a full on total relapse you know i'm 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 back at the races again um and yep. that's that's when i have to you know turn to my girlfriend turn to you know um uh, my program, you know, turn to the steps, all that stuff. And really, you know, focus, focus hard on, on what's important and what I stand to lose, you know, if that full on relapse happens, you know, and that's the problem with this disease is there's, there's always a chance that it could happen. You're never recovered. You know, there's no graduating from this program. And we all know that it's it's the type thing of you're you're in this for life and you're you're a constant student you know um and with your book being um in, in my view so so influenced by the steps you know um for me it's kind of given me uh, another tool in my arsenal that i can turn towards you know um something that i can use to right to be able to sit with my feelings a little bit easier to, you know, when bad things happen, I don't want to immediately go to, you know, Oh, I can drink a 40 about it and, and be just fine. You know, like it's, uh, it was, it was a very freeing read. Um, and it was oh, very, thank you. Yeah. Um, well, well, like I said, it was, uh, as I was reading it, I was, I was thinking the whole time about, about the steps, you know, and I was like, man, this, this is, you know, it's, they, they really go hand in hand, you know, um, it's right. Yeah. Um, so yeah. Um, but, um, yeah. So, um, I forgot what I was going to ask you. I was going to ask you one more question. Um, but I completely forgot. I, I went off on a rant. I do that all the time. Um, <laughs> Do you, so I'll, I'll move on to something else. Do you think, um, knowing yourself the way that you do know yourself, um, do you think, you know, you, you had mentioned that, you know, cannabis, you enjoy cannabis is, is that something you, you, you would be able to do like once or twice, or is it total abstinence and total abstinence is it? Total abstinence is it. Total abstinence um, is it. Yeah. I, and I'll tell you, I just, I'm sorry, go ahead. Don't want to, yeah, I just don't want to, you know, I mean, my entire support system, friends, et cetera, are in recovery. And mm -hmm. I don't need to get high to enjoy life more. In fact, I'm enjoying life really well now. And that's the hit right I there. Have that's that, the hit. Yeah. I, I have the security that, that if the worst of the worst happens, you know, one of my siblings passes or whatever those things are going to be that make it so hard to, to live with that you feel like you want to go for a drug or a drink. You know, mm -hmm. I have my support system around me. I have the people who will love me through it. And I don't have to worry about, uh, you know, relapsing during that time. As long as I stick mm -hmm. with my program, I mean, I, I kind of say it, you know, I have, uh, I have my meetings, <laughs> praying and meditating, reading the literature, and then, you know, later on spiritual literature. 
um, service and the most important working the steps with my sponsor. So right. if I'm hitting on all five of those, then I am a pretty happy camper no matter what happens. I mean, obviously yeah. things bother me at first, but I don't sure. stay in a completely distressed uh, state. And I, and I, like most of us, have anxiety slash depression I think a lot of us who are um, substance abusers have also that chemical makeup. And um, so it, you know, we, we need, and that's part of why I love marijuana in the old days, it was a very light downer, you know, it just yeah, yeah, yeah. brought me down a little from the anxiety. And um, you know, now I have meditation, I have prayer, I have calling people, I have taking walks, I have, you know, so many other ways of dealing with things that quote, I don't like, you know, <laughs> right, right. Life is much, much, life is so much better when we let our higher power just take the reins. Right. And, and, uh, we turn our thinking over to that higher power and don't live from that fearful place. That's a mm -hmm. big part of the book, the anxiety and yeah. the worry. It's what I call the ego, not the psychological part, but the fear-based self. And that was right. the self that did all those things and drank. But there is another self, the true self inside each of us. And that's a, like the light of us. And mm -hmm. you know how when you watch someone come into, well, in the old days when we had face-to-face -face meetings, you'd watch someone <laughs> walk in and... Uh, you could see you could see their pain, but you also saw this essence of goodness in them. You yeah, saw them sure. as a person. And and then when I walk in, I felt people seeing that and responding to the best aspect of Gigi that I didn't even think existed because I was so full of shame. Right. So that healing of the fellowship and, and that takes a while because it's easy to just go early, you know, go late and leave early and don't get to know anyone. Right. But we really have to let people love us so we can learn to, to heal oh, yeah. our love machine because <laughs> our right. love machine is broken. <laughs> oh yeah. Uh, that's, that's honestly, that's how I used to, uh, attend meetings. My, my first go around in recovery, I, I, Mm -hmm. I only went to meetings just because it was what everybody told me I had to do. And I sat there and watched the clock the whole time and waited for it to end. And then as soon as it was, as soon as it was over, I was out. I was just gone. I uh, didn't ever get any yep. phone numbers. Didn't, you know, didn't stick around, didn't, you know, talk or, or anything like that. And uh, these days, though, admittedly, I don't attend nearly as many meetings as I should. Um, I'm getting better at it, though. Um Good. When I do go to meetings, I do stick around afterwards. You know, um, I engage myself during the meetings. I share during the meetings. Um, and I've noticed that doing that, I don't watch the clock nearly as much, you know, that I'm engaged and I and actually leave feeling a lot better than when I walked in. Um, and that's, yeah. that's kind of the whole, the whole point of them. Right. It um, sure is. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. yeah, but the reason I, I had asked you that question before um, is because I actually have uh, several friends of mine who are in recovery, um, you know, but they do, you know, they, they smoke cannabis, they do a couple of other things. Um, everything they do is legal, um, but it's not necessarily a total abstinence, you know. And I kind of sit on the right. fence of, you know, and, and to, to be honest, you know, part of me says, Hey, if you don't have a needle in your vein, that's fine. You know, that do, do what you need mm -hmm. to, to keep that from happening. But at the same time, the other part of me says, you're not really, you know, living clean. You're, you're still doing mood and mind altering substances. And are you just replacing one thing for another, you know, some kind of on the fence there about that, but that's, that's kind of a, a personal internal conflict that I have going on. Sure. Um, sure. you know, and that and touches that, on that's MAT between, and, I'm sorry, go ahead. That's, uh, I think that's between them and their sponsors and their higher yeah. power. Yeah. And I think 
for me, hanging around long enough, I realized that if I alter my feelings chemically, then I'm um, depriving myself of an opportunity to learn how to live in a world that is full of disappointment sometimes and hardship. Right. You know, if I'm going to take the easy way out and numb myself, I'm not going to get the spiritual muscles and the, you know, mm -hmm. the ways of coping. Yeah. And, and we, we must have those. We just mm -hmm. must have them. Otherwise, absolutely. They only, you know, <laughs> escape to the, yeah. <laughs> to the drugs. And I don't yeah. want to do that yeah. anymore. So <laughs> um, there's something, there's something very special about, you know, when you get, when you get clean and you, you get that clarity of mind, the ability to be present, you know, uh, not only for friends and family, but present for yourself as well. You know, um, you're, you're able to hone in on your feelings and you're able to, to, to decipher exactly how you feel. And, um, that's, that's an experience in and of itself that, that I, I mean, me personally, I, I, that's, that's been the biggest thing for me is, is the ability to, you know, to be present for myself, to be present for others. Um, and, uh, you know, kind of take life seriously, I guess you could say, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. Yep. But yeah, it's um, a good way of life. <laughs> yeah, it's it's uh, it's a lot better on this side of the fence. Uh, that's for sure. sure is. Um, well, listen, uh, it has been fantastic talking to you. Um, it has been a fantastic read. I'm still going to I still have to finish the book, admittedly, but I'm going to get through it. I've been I've been kind of taking my time and letting it soak in a little bit. Um, are there any final thoughts, anything you'd like to say to our audience? Any kind of hope shots or anything like that? Yeah. Um, if you're not currently uh, joining with at least one other person or a group to get better, whether it's from substance abuse or something else, um, I just want you to know that the one fear I had, which was if I go to someone and get really honest, I feel like there's all this junk down there. And if I rip off the Band-Aid, it's all going to come gushing out at once and it will smother me. That is not true. That's a whispered lie. And the truth is when we get into recovery, the layers come and ready to heal when we're ready to handle them. It's like once we do that third step and sign it, give the pace of the healing and so on over to our higher power, then it doesn't come gushing out all at once and it is manageable. Mm -hmm. So that's the most important thing. The only other thing is do know that you have complete control over what fills your mind. If you're noticing the committee beating up on you and you're saying, Oh, I'm triggered. I'm triggered. Well, we can stay triggered and talk about being triggered, but what are we going to do about it to bring ourselves back to a calm place where we're not a bundle of nerves, where we can be loving and giving and kind, you know, right, and that's right. why we need to get to work with, you know, we need to get to work with the tools. It, mm -hmm. it, it's my responsibility to heal with my higher power and all the tools available to me. So even though I had a past and even though my mother did this and that, those are worth knowing, but they do not limit what we can become. Right. Fantastic. Yeah. Those are, uh, those are awesome words of yeah. wisdom. Um, yeah. well again, thank you for being on the show. I've, I've really enjoyed our talk today. Um, oh, thank you so author much. Author and uh, woman in long-term recovery, GG Langer. Um, yeah, go get yourself a copy of the book. Uh, it's 50 Ways to Worry Less. And trust me, it is well worth the read. Um, it will help you out a great deal. All right. Thank you very much. And we'll see you all later. Thanks so much. Take care. <laughs>